Hi, I'm Jason, and just before we get started, I'm getting over a cold, so I apologize if I sound a little off. (laughs) I just wanted to take a moment to recognize some of the newest members of our Patreon family. I always love interacting and talking with our patrons. It is an amazing thing to have your support. Really, it is a pinch me moment every time I get to read this list. It is such a reward to know that so many of you believe in us and what we are doing. I love every one of our patrons, but this week I decided to highlight those newest members of our patron family for this episode. Again, I can't thank you enough for your support, and I do hope you enjoyed your early release and bonus episode this past week, yeah? You can have that too. Pop on over. If you are interested in those perks and in supporting this show financially, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the gray rooms today. We would be forever grateful. And with that being said, here are the newest members of our Patreon family. Kaylee Tolls, Debbie Fur, Hale Scherf, Jason Porras, Joseph Holliday, Michael Velez, Rachel Lamb, Trig V. Christensen. God, I hope I said that right. You know I sent him a message. <laughs> J.M. Scherf. Adam. Alexei Gladilovich. And because he just couldn't wait to hear these until, I don't know, most of the rest of us hear them. He had to hear them so early. Mr. Brian Black is a patron. So, thanks, Brian. We love you. Again, greatly appreciate you, your support, And to all the other patrons, trust me, you are recognized and loved. And I'll be releasing the full list on the next story. But thanks again, and let's get on with this story. Our stories may contain graphic or sensitive content that may be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. You wake on a hard, cold floor. So cold, it burns your skin. The air smells of sulfur and ash. Your head throbs. Your mouth is dry. You have no idea how you got here. Panic sets in. Fear becomes terror. What have you done? What brought you to this place? It doesn't matter. Because now you belong to the Grey Rooms. Season 1, Episode 8. Hey, Frank. Raymond! How you doing, man? Things okay? Could be better. That good, huh? How's the old lady? Getting on my ass. I'm trying. She just doesn't see it. Women. <laughs> Still looking for a job, brother. When did it get so damn? So then I joined. Got the call next day, right? Still got my soul, too. Well, I think so, anyway. But uh, it's been good talking to you, bud. 
Good luck with all that. I mean it. Just think about what I said. Seriously. What's a little lip service, you know? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. Look, we've already talked about it, babe. I'm looking. I just... Look, I, I'm trying here. It's just those idiots aren't hiring unless you... It's not about the job, Raymond. Huh? What's wrong now? Nothing is wrong. Look, I know you've been going through a lot... I get it. But we have something really serious to discuss here. Is this the part where you think I'm drinking too much? Because I'm working on that too. Remember how we didn't think we'd be able to have a baby? God damn it! I... You need, need to get a napkin. Where are the paper towels? Ah oh, shit, now it's on the carpet. I'll take care of this. Sorry, I'll- Leave it, Raymond! Did you hear my question? You're pregnant? I'm going to pretend you didn't just ruin the moment. Raymond, I'm pregnant. Gray rooms again. I woke up on my back and immediately found myself checking my arm. The whole nightmare prison turned out to be a rather easy death for me. I suffered from the same revulsion and sickening guilt that I had with the other psychos whose lives I witnessed. But the death, almost calming calming. This was a piece of shit who deserved to die. Calming. Like the quiet I had before the... I quickly checked to see if the light was still there. It was. It flickered too. Why the hell was this new bulb flickering? Where? Where did that monster go? And where was Bob? Bob? Hello, Raymond. Jesus Christ, Bob! Where the hell were you? Oh, are you talking about the incident, Raymond? The incident? Yes! Something got in here and tried to kill me! I see. Well, that's certainly unusual, isn't it? Don't get cute, Bob. What happens if I die here? Same thing that happens if you die anywhere else, Raymond. I'm sorry. You sound upset that I wasn't there. Of course I was, you dick! The light burned out and something tried to kill me! Well, you're safe now. For a moment. So where were you? I had to be somewhere else. That's all I'm going to get? Look, I know it's hard to believe, but the universe doesn't revolve around you, Raymond. I have other things that I do. Like what? Would you like to hear another haiku? No! Come on, Bob! Stop bullshitting me! What else do you do? Do you have a family? Do you go ballroom dancing? Did you ever go ballroom dancing? I... I don't remember. I don't think so. Although... Bob... Can, can I be honest with you? Of course. 
Bob, I think I had a baby. Like, before. Before this. Do you, do you know anything about it? I'm guessing you probably can't tell me, but like, I, I don't even know if this is just a weird dream or- Raymond, I'm going to have to ask you to choose a door. What? Come on, Bob, just a yes or no. I'll even let you tell me your haikus. Boy, girl, I just can't remember, man. Why, why can't, why can't I remember? Choose a door, Raymond. I didn't understand why Bob wouldn't tell me anything about the memories I was having. What did it matter to him? He was always the one trying to play the friend card to get me to be complacent. Was it so hard to just throw me a bone once in a while? The first door looked as if it belonged in some Victorian courtyard. It was made of iron and covered in ivy. I heard the singing again. I decided to keep as far away from it as possible. The second door seemed as if it were going to transport me into some kid's bedroom. There was a sign on the door. It read, Tips on how to enter my room properly. Step one, do not. I didn't hear the song, and I placed the key into the door to unlock it. It's not important, you know. It is important to me, Bob. I don't remember it. The past will only hold you back, Raymond. Shut up, Bob. I know Lucy and I had a baby. I know it. And you better believe when I get back, we're going to have some words. Let the record show that prisoner 929494 has chosen door 577. White light heaven. Lucy. Let the record also show that prisoner 929494 is demonstrating both a significant reclamation of his memory and an unusual sense of confidence when it's his turn to choose a door. I have my suspicions, and will begin to investigate. It's so bright. I can't open my eyes, I can't see. No, not bright. Empty. I'm lost. You're here. Where's here? Everywhere and nowhere. Sometimes here and sometimes there. I can't see. Hold my hand. Guide me. There's nothing to guide. I'm scared. There's nothing to be scared of. You're alone. Heaven. This is heaven, I know it. No, this isn't heaven. There's no heaven here. I'm so cold. Where are you? Reaching out. It's lonely here. I want to go home. So do I. Can we? There's no home here. There's nothing in a place like this. Only loneliness and sorrow. I don't like this. It's cold and dark. But the warmth of light surrounds you. Can you not feel it warm your soul? 
It's there. Everywhere. No. Not really. It's dark here. Everywhere. Choking and black. Darkness. Consuming you? Consuming me? Do you think we're... Yes. You mean... Yes. What happened? I reached out. I can't see you. Please come, please help. I, I try to walk, but I have no legs. Neither fingers nor mouth. I can't feel anything anymore. I can't scream. You're nothing. I am something. I am me. But you don't remember. I do. I do. What are you? Weary. I can't keep my eyes open. You forget. No. You've forgotten. I'm not dead. I'm not. Go away. Go away and leave me alone. Do you remember being alive? No. But I don't think... Well, does that matter? Did you ever live? I don't think so. I, I don't know. I don't know. What are you? Who are you? What is anyone? I don't know anymore. I want to wake up. I want to open my eyes. Open your eyes. I can't. Truth surrounds you. What is it? See for yourself. Is truth good? It's bleak. Why? The truth is very harsh. That's why you hide. Will I find happiness in truth? You'll find life. Open your eyes. What if I don't? What if I can't? Open them. A Costanza can do anything. Be awake. Be free. No, I can't. I'll just fail like I did before. I know I failed. I always do something wrong. Why are you punishing me? This is hell. I'm in hell where the bad people go. I've done bad things. What have I done? I don't even know. Who am I? What am I? Why am I here? There is no punishment in this place. This is no place. It's merely here within. I'm staying. I deserve to be here. You aren't here. Be free. Be awake. No. The lights, they're bright and hideous. I'll hide. I'll hide from you. I'll hide from light. Everything. I'll hide from everything in the darkness. Mrs. Costanza continued to hold her daughter's hand. My baby. She thought. How could he do this to my baby? It wasn't just her baby, she realized. She turned to her husband and felt her free hand slipping into his. Our baby. She whispered. Come back to us, please. Please, God, bring her back to us. But she was answered only with the wheezing sound of her daughter's respirator. She searched everywhere for hope. But hope was lost. How many times she had prayed for her little girl, but yet her girl continued to sleep. Oh, how her heart ached. Her husband's hand quivered and she laid her head down on his shoulder. She envied her husband. Her husband was a strong man, but she could hear the sniffling and she could feel his heart, frightened and weary. It thrummed erratically and she knew he was crying. She tried to cry, but her tears had dried up weeks ago. Perhaps the first night after the shock, and in secret after all of the sirens and lights calmed down, leaving her to herself. Her thumbs gently caressed the palms of her sleeping beauty. Mr. Costanza put his arm around his wife's waist and hugged it tightly. Her warmth was reassuring. How long had they been in the hospital with her? Every day, not a single hour had passed during visiting hours. And yet he was also concerned because of his job. Because of the coming life tucked away within. This sorrow and pain, he wondered. Would the baby feel it? Would it be sensitive to the mother's agony? The car had sped so fast around the bend. What was the driver thinking? He could still hear his daughter's voice. I did it! I'm doing it! He remembered the smile. It 
It was a typical day in July with sweltering heat. Roaring lawnmowers and a bright, cheerful sun to blast out every cloud from the sky. He watched his girl pedaling down the street and stuck his hands in his pockets, quite content with himself. One more lesson in life to check off, he thought. The doctors were not optimistic for the Costanza girl. Her life was in the hands of a machine. Once unplugged, there would be nothing to keep the child alive. Yet the Costanzas still waited for their child to come back to them. They longed for the day to come when she would open her eyes and assure them that things were okay. Sometimes they wondered if she had seen the white light, the notorious tunnel to heaven, and hoped that she'd refused to go. They needed their little girl. They needed her a lot more than God did. Was God that terrible to claim the life of their child? Months went by, and the Costanzas found themselves too busy to visit their child. A court case was filed against the speeding motorist. Gavels slammed and jurors listened. Mothers and fathers and testimonies were examined and concluded. The driver had had an argument with his wife. She didn't like his heavy drinking and knew it was getting out of hand. There had been many things said, unhappy things, and he left, driving off in fury. He was so angry that when he flew around the curve of a narrow street, he didn't realize there was a child taking her time pedaling up the hill. The child was saying something. Then he hit her. And all he remembered was seeing red. Lots of it. Shrill screams. Manslaughter. Fifteen years imprisonment. Divorce papers eventual. Guilt and suffering, infinite. With the trial, the Costanza family had forgotten their lonely child, who looked more and more like an abandoned doll gathering dust on an empty shelf, trapped within a crystal white room with diagrams of spinal cords and roadmaps to arteries. The girl lay without chattering. She was without laughs and without smiles. She was deprived of sickness, even sorrow. Her company was the sound of a respirator. Inflation, deflation, up and down. Breathe in, breathe out. Once the court case was finished and the bills, lawyers, loans, and mortgages had been paid from the court case, the Costanzas faced another problem in the form of a baby girl. There were things to buy and sacrifices to be made. Bottles of formula, school clothes, lunch money, prom dresses, cars, wedding expenses, things would never let up. Their second daughter was a busy girl and insisted on having all the attention. She lived it, thrived upon it. She took it all for granted. Soon, Mr. and Mrs. Costanza were very old. Their new daughter was happily married and had children of her own. She abandoned her parents and insisted on living a life all her own. Eventually, there was no place for the parents, no home, and they were placed under the care of the people at Elderberry Court. They were lonely there, for their daughter never made one visit. They missed her family and their grandchildren, but most of all, past catching back up with them, they missed their little girl. Hello? Their phone calls oftentimes reminded the new daughter of her sister and constantly irritated her. Jealousy grew within her heart. Was it not her sister, who was merely a vegetable, sucking up her parents' funds while they sat about playing bingo and watching The Price is Right? Why were they talking about her sister, who couldn't praise them and couldn't buy them things and couldn't tell them that she loved them? What did she mean to them? She was just a dummy. One big, expensive dummy, granted a tragedy, but one that should have been buried long ago. But her parents filled with guilt, made the daughter commit to keeping her sister on the machine, and she felt compelled to do so. She hated it. She didn't want to be bothered, and with three kids, she certainly couldn't afford it. Did her parents think that she was going to tell her children they couldn't go to college because she had to pay for their vegetable of an aunt? She lied. She persuaded them that she cared. 
at least they wouldn't have to feel guilty anymore. They were dying. The thought had been on the tip of her tongue for quite some time, but she couldn't accept it. She wondered if they called her to relieve themselves of the guilty conscience that had been plaguing them for so long. It's what she wanted to wonder. She needed a family and not just her own, not anymore. Despite how much she loathed talking to them about her, and it always was her that they spoke of, she needed to hear their voices. She missed them, and they missed her. She'd always force a smile upon her face and hold back the tears and the feelings of resentment. She'd be brave for them until they left her. Then she'd be done with her sister. And she'd be able to tell herself that what she did was right. And she'd believe it. Once they were gone. And it wouldn't be much longer. What time is it? Endless. And the day? Today. And tomorrow? The same as the day after. Have I become blind? Only by choice. I'm afraid. Take my hand. It's there for you. I have it. Let it go. Let it all go. Leave this place. I don't want to. You need to. Circles. 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 Deja vu? No more stories. What do you remember? I remember... stories. Dreams of others. Unhappy ones. Ones ending in death. They always end. All things do. I don't. You did. I don't think. Home. Where do I belong? Here? I've forgotten it's been so long. Open your eyes. Open them. The light. It'll consume me. You feared the light for so long. But it matters not what is light or what is dark. What is the light? Truth. Will it help me? Will it set me free? It's a path. And darkness? Nothing. Here. Everywhere. Everything. Guide me home. I'm so cold. I'm so tired. Lonely? Yes. Must I open my eyes? Will you hold me? Don't let go. You'll do fine. You're a Costanza, and Costanzas can do anything. All right. Stay behind me, Dad. Don't leave. Dad? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Thanks. Hey. I'm doing it. I'm doing it, Dad? Dad, you left. Hey, I'm doing this by myself. I, I did it. I can do it. I knew you could do it. I'm proud of you. We're all proud of you. The woman's eyes opened. A young nurse screamed and dropped the bedpan she was holding. Metallic tools gave a loud clang as they crashed to the floor. What? What happened? The doctor yelled. Her eyes! The doctor bent down to look at the woman. Skin flushed and face sullen. His eyes darted to the heart monitor, listening to the pounding of his own through his ears. The sister ran over to the doctor, now glancing at the woman whom she'd never known, but always detested. She had been standing there, trying as best she could to be a rock. She'd go to hell for something like this, maybe, if she wasn't already considered dead to God. Money was wasted from the court case, as was the money from her parents' own pocket to keep this firstborn of theirs alive. It was a joke. The prodigal daughter, the one whom her parents would always remember with such love and affection, lay before her, eyes open, grim frown worn upon the beloved's face. How much she had longed for their attention all her life. How great her wish that her family would have forgotten that stupid, stupid girl. Why hadn't the driver killed her? 
Why did her family have to spend so much on that thing? Why so much sacrifice? They loved her more. That was why. She knew it, deep down. They loved that zombie more than her. They didn't care about her. They never did. Is something wrong? Why are her eyes open? Is she awake? Doctor? The doctor took a hard swallow and stared at the floor, taking heavy breaths before regaining composure. It's nothing, miss. Sometimes when we turn them off, their eyes open. It's the nerves, they... He trailed off into silence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to see. The sister's hostile glare at the vegetable's body switched to horror. The eyes looked like those of an innocent doe. Big, wet, brown eyes. Inviting, loving, ever so warm. She turned away and fought back tears and pings of guilt. She couldn't look back. Not now, not ever. The decision had been made. She walked. The nurse stood there cupping her mouth. Was there something else? Had her sister been waking up out of the coma? Her pace quickened to a mad dash, her arms outstretched for the door. Miss! The doctor cried. Miss, your sister! What do you want done with the... She ran out the door, into her car, and drove down the street. She had to leave as quickly as she could, lead foot stomping on the gas pedal. Tears ran down her eyes and streaked mascara sloppily down her face. Her nerves shook and screamed, and her conscience goaded her with repulsion. She abandoned her sister, and she would never have to come back. She would never come back. Ever. Forty-five years the child spent in solitude. Forty-five years. And now, she was no longer afraid. White Light Heaven was written by Brian Black. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Darth Chair. White Light Heaven was performed by Amanda Lee Cobb. You can find out more about Amanda on her website, amandaleecobb.com. I have to say, it was a pleasure working with Amanda, and I do hope you enjoy listening to her just as much as we enjoyed working with her. Thank you, Amanda. White Light Heaven was also performed by Graham Rowett. You can follow Graham on Twitter, at GrahamNY. Audio design and editing were by me, Jason Wilson. You can follow me on Twitter at Audio Torment. Artwork for this episode was by Brooks Bigley. You can follow Brooks on Twitter at Brooks underscore Bigley. And if you feel like it, go ahead and jump on over to Patreon and say hi to him. He loves IPAs. So, yeah, help us get him some. No problem, Brooks. Got your back. The Grey Room's theme is written by J.M. Scherf. You can follow J.M. Scherf on Twitter at J.M. Scherf Music. The Raymond series was also written by Brian Black. And it was performed by David O'Steele as Frank. You can follow David on Twitter at David O'Steele. And Christina Wilson as Lucy. You can follow her on Twitter at Ryden That Wave. And of course, the illustrious Graham Rowett as Bob. And the role of Raymond was performed by me, Jason Wilson. As always, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to listen to what we create. It is you that truly makes this exciting and fun. We do currently have our Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash the Grey Rooms pod, and a Twitter of the same name. We also have an Instagram. Instagram.com forward slash the Grey Rooms podcast. But we also have a Patreon. Feel free to jump on over to Patreon.com forward slash the Grey Rooms and uh, help us get to 50 patrons. 
we have a couple really neat ideas for when that happens. And we do currently have a sale going on over at TeePublic. That's tpublic.com forward slash the gray rooms. So thanks again ever so much for your time. And we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>